media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Bursts, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. Welcome back to the show, Hilliard, and even though it's uh, minus 8 in Vancouver, which is unusual, I'm sure it's a little more chilly than that in Edmonton. It was uh, minus 33 when I took the dog. I, I, it's been all over the news. You're not supposed to take your dog out for a walk, but I, I defied that and that order and because uh, the dog has got lots of hair, and uh, he loves the snow and the cold, so uh, we went for a 20-minute walk. It would have been great, except for the having to take your gloves off to pick up the poop, right? So <laughs> that was the only that was the only catch. And then my my hands got so cold. But anyway, I made it. So I feel like I've accomplished something. Anyway, Hilliard, we have to come up with some kind of a pooper scooper glove. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, something that you can do without. Uh, yeah, it's uh, but to, it, it, it's it's twisting that thing and then you know securing it. That's the tough part. It's, uh, but somebody said to me, "Well, why don't you just leave it there? Nobody's going to be outside to see it anyway." But my uh, it'll my... be there in the spring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hilliard is phase one of the trade agreement between the U.S. and China in danger. I believe it is. I believe the news just came out um, as we're speaking here, um, and they said that the tariffs are going to remain in place until after the November election. So basically, they just didn't have a deal and. I, you know, I kind of, I wondered because the, um, they kept saying that they had a deal. They kept saying they were going to sign the agreement on January the 15th. So, um, and, uh, but they never, there was no details and there was nothing in writing. So the group of negotiators that, uh, the U.S. has is, is, includes a fellow named Peter Navarro, an economist that's been really, uh, you know, shouting from the hilltops about China for many years and, some other people that are, I would say, more um, emotionally involved and more ideologically involved than than, um, than is good for negotiations. Uh, but the but the deeper problem is there's no real incentive for anybody to settle before November 2020, before the election, because um, if Trump, uh, if the president um, Donald Trump caves into the Chinese. He loses votes at at, at the polls when it t- comes time for the election. It, Everybody agrees, whether it's Democrat or Republican, that uh, they want China to be dealt with in a tough and and um, non, you know, a, re- a really aggressive manner in the negotiations. So um, that's sort of not Trump's. Actually, Trump's interesting. You know, he calls himself a great negotiator, but on several other things like North Korea, uh, he, he has a tendency to um, to be willing to uh, to give a lot in order to get a little bit. Um, some people will call that caving, I guess, but uh, but in this case, it's not going to work because uh, he has to, um, in order to you know keep the votes going into November, he has to take a tough line with China, and I'm sure that's what happened here. And the other clue that it wasn't going to be any good was uh, about a month ago they started talking about the negotiations starting for the Phase Two deal. Well, you know why are they talking about a Phase Two deal already and they haven't even signed a Phase One deal? That 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 was a hint that there was something not working very well. Does that mean that no negotiations are now taking place and won't? Well, it, it certainly looks like that. I don't know. There's just this is just brand new, and and um, but uh, and I don't even know if the signing is going to happen. That's the other thing because why you know if the tariffs are going to remain in place, like there's not much point in signing. What I think the problem they had was when they signed the deal, they were going to have to show people what's on the piece of paper, <laughs> whether it was written in Chinese or whether whether it was written in English. And, uh, but it also seems like the Chinese also are in a similar position to the Americans in that for domestic consumption back home, 
they can't be seen to be um, caving in at all. You know, the, the Chinese have a, in 2015, they launched a 2025 initiative called Made in China 2025. And they're very aggressive in building up their own economy and they're doing the Belt and Road Initiative and a bunch of other things. And, and a lot of it's got to do with they want to become a dominant world superpower uh, and be restored to their status, you know, from, from many, many, many decades ago. And, um, so they can't be seen to be, uh, um, being, um, too amenable to what the U.S. is offering either. So it, it's got the makings of, um, something that's going to be with us for many years, if not a decade or, or even two decades. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, a uh, U.S. bond rating agency, says Canada's mortgage growth rate is at its lowest in 20 years. What is that rate, and what does it mean for the Canadian economy? So at the end of um, last year, in December, the uh, growth rate had dipped below 4% uh, annually, which is the lowest in many, many uh, years, a couple of decades for at least. And uh, what that means is that there isn't enough new credit being pushed into the economy to keep the economy going. So as, as everybody knows, I think with the amount of debt level that we have in Canada, it's the highest and you know, one of the top two in the developed world. Um, and the fact, as everybody knows, that uh, consumer spending is a significant factor in um, the economy. About 60 or 70 percent of the economy is consumer spending now. You need that continual new flow of, let's call it credit, going into the economy in order to keep the economy growing. And a certain amount of that credit is needed just to um, roll over the existing debt because you can't have people paying back more debt than what they're taking out in new debt or else everybody would have less money to spend and everybody have all the businesses would be short of customers. So you have to grow it. If the economy is growing by, say, let's say um, uh, 3 or 4% uh, nominal uh, before the adjustment for inflation, you need that much more credit in the economy just to finance the bills that are being paid every day by everybody on their credit cards and their mortgages and their car loans and all that stuff. So in order to have any impetus to make the economy grow, it's got to be an extra increment above that, above the 3 to 4% GDP growth to put new uh, buying power into the economy. So when the, when the, when the Fitch uh, rating agency says, the uh, mortgage growth has dipped below 4%. We've been watching it on the... Um, it actually dipped quite a bit lower than that, and it's on a bit of a rebound now, but it's still around 4%. Um, it's just not enough. And so that, along with a bunch of other uh, uh, news that came out in the last uh, 60 days, um, has indicated that uh, Canada is very close to a recession, if not already in a recession. The, uh, For instance, the um, job losses in November, the... Uh, uh, retail sales. Retail sales reported at the end of December for no, for November year over year were negative. That's almost never happens because you know all the housing bulls are talking about all the immigration, all the new people coming to Canada. That's going to keep the housing market up. Well, so how can retail sales actually go lower than a year ago? The inflation is one or two percent. Uh, GDP growth is another one or two percent. Immigration is one or two percent. Um, you know, retail sales should be growing at at least three or four or five percent a year. And, and, and mortgage growth is a really good indicator of that. If people aren't taking out new mortgages, they're not buying houses, they're not spending, and, uh, then the, uh, the whole thing slows down. And if it slows down much at all, 
then you've got a problem because now uh, some, at some point you get a recession and then people start paying back their debts instead of taking out new debts and, and it compounds. And that's what um, an economist named Hyman Minsky was talking about when he coined, when, when now people refer to as the Minsky moment, when, uh, when the repayment of debt becomes more important than the taking out of new debt. Well, do people underestimate what the purchases of a new home or even existing home means to the economy? That means you're not using moving companies, you're not buying new furniture, electricians aren't updating the, the home system, uh, you're not buying new appliances. It's a real trickle-down effect when housing slows down. It's one of the most important segments, and probably in Vancouver and Toronto, it is the most important segment, but overall, all of Canada included, it has been up around, uh, the peak was around 8%, but it's been above 6% of GDP for at least a decade, and um, which is a very high number because we saw what happened in the U.S. in 2006 when the, when the market peaked. It hit, the GDP uh, going to housing hit 6% in 2006. It dropped all the way down below 3% in the U.S., and now it's back to about 4%. So... Even in in the best economy in decades, according to some people in the U.S., um, the amount of money going into uh, housing is, uh, as a percentage, is about half of what it is in Canada. So Canada's been running very hot on the housing for a long time, for many years, and uh, a slowdown in the mortgage rates um, and the growth of mortgages uh, indicates a slowdown in housing, which indicates um, a big cropping up of the economy is is losing its strength and of course we already know the oil and gas has really lost a lot of uh, momentum so two big segments of the economy um struggling and uh, canada is you know on uh, i guess we're on recession watch at this point we'll have more with hilliard Macbeth right after this Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, Tesla, has it pulled out of danger of going bankrupt? Well, you know, I don't think there ever was any danger of it's going bankrupt. I think the uh, the short sellers were were pushing that pretty hard, but it just didn't make any sense. But, um, yeah, the stock has gone up over $500 now. When I bought my first Tesla in, uh, I think it was 2016, uh, so it's coming up to four years now, the stock was around $150 when I bought the car. But I said, well, I'd like to buy some shares, but I thought I better wait and drive the car for a few months um, uh, before I buy the shares just to do some market research. And, uh, after a few months I was ready to buy, but it had already shot up close to $300. So I bought a little bit. Um, and then it dipped back down and I wish I'd bought more, but now it's up above $500 now. So the, the total market value of, uh, Tesla now is over probably, uh, last time I checked it was 88 billion. So it's probably up close to a hundred billion now. And, uh, that is bigger. Believe it or not, that's bigger than Ford and General Motors combined in terms of the value of the company. And Tesla is still only making less than 500,000 cars a year, although that's going to increase rapidly in the next couple of years with the new factory in China and the new factory coming in Germany. But um, the reason, though, they were never close to going bankrupt was, uh, well, a couple of reasons. One is there's tons of investors, including people like Larry Ellison from Oracle and, and um, I'm sure many others who would be willing to uh, buy shares in Tesla if if they needed money. Um, and secondly, there's some really strict new rules in um, in Europe that uh, the people that are making cars with diesel and gasoline have to meet, and they can't meet them. They don't have enough electric cars uh, being produced by Volkswagen and Mercedes and companies like that. So they have to buy credits. So Tesla has 
uh, billions, literally billions of dollars worth of these credits available to sell. And they made a deal with, uh, I think, Fiat Chrysler uh, to sell these credits. And they're getting, um, I, I, it's in the billions of dollars. I don't know the exact amount of money from them. And the new rules started January the 1st, 2020. So um, those uh, those amounts will, will um, they were getting some money before, but the, the amounts now are going to go up pretty uh, uh, substantially. Also, you have uh, mandated use of electric vehicles. I mean, even BC says, I don't know, what, 2050 or 2032, they're not going to allow the sale of gasoline-powered cars anymore. Well, so the, the numbers are quite startling. So there's, there, there were about 88 million cars sold in the world, and about 24 million of them were China. And China, a lot of the buyers in China, I think 80% or some number like that, were first time buyers. So it wasn't like us who, you know, get tired of our car after, after five or 10 years and, and go and get a new one. These people never had a car before and now they're buying a new car. So, and um, the, the, the same thing would be true in India when they start buying cars, if they start buying cars. So, so, um, so for Tesla to be producing, uh, less than half a million cars, we're talking well under, um, about half of 1%. Now, in uh, China, they had the highest proportion of cars that are considered electric, or they call them new energy vehicles. There, um, I forget the exact number, but it, it's it's of the 24 million they were selling in China, it was you know maybe a million or two. I don't know exactly, but it, it wasn't even 10 percent. So, if everybody says by 2032 or whatever the date is that uh, there will be no more um, internal combustion es- uh, engine cars, like ICE as they call it. Um, where who's going to be able to build all these cars? Tesla can't do it. I mean, they're talking like even even imagine that um, people really get um, uh, on board with the uh, with the things like Uber and and um, and ride sharing and that sort of thing. There's still going to be demand for uh, thirty, forty, fifty million cars a year, probably. And that's that would be less than half the current rate. And uh, um. There's no way that Tesla could build that many cars. I, I'm thinking that Tesla might be able to get to 2 million cars a year by 2022 or 2023, which would justify its current market price, um, assuming no recession between now and then and a few other assumptions. But that, that's only 2 million. So they, they you know, who else? The, the big manufacturers, GM, Ford, Chrysler, and Mercedes and Volkswagen, they just haven't moved very quickly to get. Now, eventually, maybe they'll get there, but they would have to... Um, the largest, um, the two largest in the world are Toyota and Volkswagen. They each produce about 10 million cars each. And for them to switch over and start producing, say, 5 million electric cars by, uh, by 2025 each, that, that's, that, that would be a huge stretch. I don't know if they'd be able to do it. Uh, Toyota too has hung its hat on hybrids, not pure electric. Isn't that the case or are they going to change? Yeah, and hybrids are ridiculously bad technology, right? They, um, uh, they, they have to run two, um, systems, the, uh, the ice, uh, the old ice system and then the brand new electric battery system. And it's reassuring to, uh, the driver and it made sense for a while, but it's increasingly not going to make any sense because most of the hybrids are actually just driven by gasoline and the, the, the batteries recharged from the gasoline engine in the car. Um, it's not really coming from uh, plugging in for a, for a recharge with the battery, um, and so. But, but the big thing about one of the big things about electric is the simplicity of manufacturing, and the almost entire absence of the need for any maintenance. So, the hybrid thing uh, doesn't work in those in those respects. It's still very complicated to manufacture. The other thing that Toyota is so hopefully Toyota gets, but they're very slow. Like they. They have, they've put a whole bunch of their research and development into uh, hydrogen cars, and that may or may not work out, but they just, so between hybrids and hydrogen, uh, they haven't really done much. Now, on the other hand, Volkswagen has, is committed to doing a lot because they got caught with the diesel, um, cheating scandal on the emissions, uh, standards. And so they put a lot more energy into, um, into research into electric cars. They've also, Volkswagen, as part of their settlement with the U.S. government for cheating, um, they've built out a supercharger, well, a charger network, um, a fast charger network all across the U.S. I, I, I don't know, I don't think it's finished yet, but 
it's um i think it's an 11 billion dollar um uh spend and that'll really do a lot towards um bringing electric cars into the mainstream because the, the tesla superchargers which are great are only available to tesla owners so they need to have a something else that uh, could be used for volkswagens or toyotas or whatever else in britain on one of their major motorways as they call their freeways they have what they call the green strip where if you drive in that lane it will automatically charge your electric car do you see anything like that happening in canada or is our (laughs) weather just too severe to have automatic charging highways yeah i don't it doesn't sound like it's very efficient so the the other thing it would be to to, it's not that big a deal you know most people when they think about this they think oh yeah but i gotta stop for an hour and charge up and and that's true if you're if you're empty and you um you run it right to right down to almost empty and you want to do a full charge it can take up to an hour uh, although the new fast chargers that the faster chargers that Tesla's bringing out uh, might bring that down to half an hour but in reality what does what happens more more often is if you're driving say from Calgary to Vancouver um you what you'll do is you'll stop uh, two or three times for um half an hour an hour uh, maybe half an hour is all you need. Um, and, uh, you know, you kind of need to have something to eat and go to the bathroom and all that. So it's not really that big a hardship. I find a lot of times, we've done Vancouver three times now, and uh, I find a lot of times the car is ready before we are. So we're having a nice lunch or something. We're finishing up our lunch and get the little little notification on the app on your phone that the car is ready to go again because it calculates how much charge you need to get to the to the next stop. And um, And you can see... So you just let it charge a little bit longer um, and just finish up your lunch. So it's really not a hardship unless you're one of those people that just is determined to drive 12 hours straight without stopping. But I, d- I don't know how many people there are like that. Hilliard, thank you so much for chatting with us. Nice to talk to you again. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. Where can you get that book, Hilliard? At all of the best bookstores, and you can also order it from Chapters, Indigo, um, Amazon, online as well. So um, it's just important to to make sure you get the second edition. Uh, and the, in the physical form, that's got a red, a big red lettering on the front. And um, I'd encourage people to get the second edition. Uh, the other thing people can do is... Um, is uh, sign up for my weekly note. It's called the Weekend Note, and um, they can just find me. It's easy to find through Twitter or uh, even email, and and uh, we'll sign you up, and then you'll automatically receive the Weekend Note. And it's uh, uh, for now anyway. It's free to uh, to access, and it isn't always about housing. It's uh, it's on lots of other topics as well. And Hilliard's website is MacbethGroup.com. If you have any questions for Hilliard or any of our other guests. You can send them to info at HowStreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.